draw people in. One of the things we mentioned yesterday was to, to become better at engaging unbelievers. The key is not to get a master's degree in philosophy or to get a doctorate in science. I mean, if, if you know those things or have those things, they can help you. But that, that's only going to help you in rare, rare encounters with unbelievers. And truthfully, the more important thing is that we would know what we believe, that we would know the scriptures, know sound doctrine. Because that's really the root of our engagement with unbelievers, is we are trying to, we're going to let them tell us what they believe. So I don't need to know that ahead of time. But I do want to know clearly what I believe for several reasons. If you have a person, for example, who says, well, I can just never believe in a God who just strikes people down for no reason and, uh, you know, is full of wrath and no mercy. If we're not paying attention, we're going to try to defend that God, and that's not the God we believe in. If someone says that, I just can't believe in a capricious God that's all about wrath, I say, well, I don't believe in that kind of God either. The God I believe in is both wrath and loving, angry at sin but provides a way out. So I never want to defend a God or a concept that I don't truly believe. So this session is on the truths we hold dear. This is basically a brief systematic theology on a couple key areas so that we we are clearly conveying what we do believe and not trying to defend something that we would disagree with. So let's start, first of all, with the doctrine of Scripture. What is the Bible? There's many ideas about what the Bible is. Some people would say it's simply pious people's reflections on their experiences of the divine. In other words, some people think the Bible is is a written record of people from 2,000 years ago that that talked about how they saw angels and saw visions. And by the way, that is what a lot of sacred world literature is. The Hindu Vedas, the Buddhist sutras, they're often people's reflection on their experience with divine, their own encounters with ways in which they get further enlightened or escape the illusions of the world. Other people would say that the Bible is a collection of myths that some people take to be divine. In other words, these stories of the ten plagues and Daniel in the lion's den and Jonah in the whale, Jesus walking on the water. You know, we have those kind of myths in ancient literature. Well, it's true. There are a lot of myths, miracle stories in ancient literature. But, but whenever you actually compare those side by side, the Bible's accounts of miracles are markedly different in a lot of ways, because it does not bring in these fanciful ideas, but rather simple things of Jesus walking on water in a way that we know physically to be impossible, but he's not, you know, bringing the stars down to earth or something like that, which we know uh, would be impossible in the world God has made. So the Christian view, what does the Christian view say about the Bible? The Christian view says that the Bible is the revelation of God the revelation of God about himself and his divine plan to redeem the world. That is, it's really important that we as Christians understand what this is. One of the things I was taught growing up is the Bible is the B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. That's terrible. Don't ever call the Bible this. Does anybody read instruction manuals? I mean, other than when I get Ikea furniture and you have no choice, um, you should really read this. It's a 2,000-page instruction manual. No, thank you. Now, does the Bible contain instruction for our lives? It does. But the, that's not what the purpose of the Bible is. The purpose of the Bible is for God to reveal, here's who I am. Here's what the world is. Here's who you are, and here's how you can be reconciled to me. It's the eternal, infinite God showing us who we are. This is precious. This is This is um, unlike anything else in the world, and therefore I need to make sure people know this is what I think, this is what the Bible says it is. The Bible also claims to be, and we believe it to be, the very word of God to his creatures for the purpose of establishing a relationship with him. That is, why do we love the Bible? Unbelievers are so puzzled by our adherence to the Bible. But we want to tell them the Bible is God showing us how we can be reconciled to him, which is the deep felt cry of every person. 
Again, it's why every religion in the world was created in an attempt to be reconciled to God, although they are distorted examples of that. The words of Scripture are the very words of God breathed out by God himself. This is what we call a doctrine of inspiration. We don't mean by inspiration that Paul sat down on this lovely day on the Greek coast overlooking the white top buildings in the blue Mediterranean Sea, you know, had a Pellegrino water next to him and a nice croissant. No, he's not inspired in that way. And it's different than the way Shakespeare and, and other authors are inspired. Rather, it's the word in 1 Timothy 3.16 is actually God breathed out, God exhaled, God spoke. These are the very words of the infinite God. Therefore, they are so full of wisdom and revelation of an infinite being to us as finite creatures. That is what we believe the Bible to be. And then God, the Holy Spirit, we're told, moved human authors to write his words so that each word and the final finished product are exactly what God wanted to be written without any errors. Let's take a moment and look at 2 Peter 1. This is what we call the doctrine of inerrancy that there are no errors in the Bible. And let me tell you, oh, there are hundreds and hundreds of accusations through the years of, well, the Bible got this wrong. And it's either based on a misunderstanding of what the Bible's saying, or it's based on a lack of archaeological evidence, which is then discovered and disproven. So 2 Peter 1, Peter lays out, here's how the Bible came about. He says in verse 16, We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, in the ancient world, the first century when Peter's writing, you have the Roman gods, you have the Greek gods, you have all these different stories of how the world came to be. And in most people in the ancient world, they fully believed those myths. And it defined who they were, defined what was right and wrong, defined their purpose in life. And Peter says, when we're telling you the story about Jesus who rose again, don't think that we're, we're just coming up with a new story. We're actually telling you the, the real story of how this all happened. He says at the end of verse 16, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter said, what I'm telling you is based on eyewitness testimony. And by the way, there's a great book out there. Oh man, I'm going to sell out of these. This is the finest book. It's written by a, a former cold case detective named Warner Wallace. It's called Cold Case Christianity. Uh, And all through it, he weaves in stories, a lot like Lee Strobel does in A Case for Christ. He weaves through different investigations of cold cases that he did and how they pieced together evidence and uncovered and solved the problems. He said, when you apply that process to the New Testament, to what we believe as Christians, he says, the evidence for Christianity, historically, archaeologically, literarily, geographically, he says, it's overwhelming. This is a powerful book. For anyone who says, well, I just think the Bible's full of errors. You know, there's, there's nothing true in it. It's a bunch of made-up stories. This guy's like, no way. If you apply simple detective procedures to the Bible, you come to realize that it supports itself in every way. So it's a great book. And Peter says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice. Peter's testifying of what he saw, what he heard. And Warner Wallace talks about these kind of eyewitness testimonies of events that happen. Um, He said, now, when people are making up something, it's pretty obvious to spot. For example, if four different people tell you the exact same thing, he's like, they've probably colluded together. It's kind of like the story I tell of students. Four students showed up late for an exam or skipped an exam. This this didn't really happen. It's a joke, just to prepare you. And uh, they said, Professor, we didn't make it back. We had a flat tire. And so he immediately separated all four students because they all said the same exact thing. And he went into each one of them and simply said, which tire was flat? (laughs) Because when people are colluding together to make up a story, all their details are identical. And he talks about how this argument that we have four Gospels and they contradict, he's like, you don't understand historical reporting. The very fact that you have different perspectives and people focusing on different things in the middle of of an event speaks to the reality and reliability of it, not to the error of it at all. 
And uh, that's really encouraging. That's what Peter's saying, is what we're telling you about, we saw, we heard this voice. He's talking about Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Verse 19, and then he says, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. It could also be translated, we have something even more reliable than our own eyewitness testimony, our ear witness testimony. This is even more reliable than our own experience. What Peter's saying is, our experiences of God, where we see Jesus in the flesh, see him glorified, believe us, we were there, we heard it, there's several of us that saw it clearly. Many people saw Jesus in his resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul lists them all. Which again, if you're making up this story, you would never do, because these people are all still alive. Peter, James, the apostles, and then over 500 people in Jerusalem. The reason Paul lists it that way is he said, if you don't believe us, go ask all these people. They're still around. They'll tell you, oh man, I saw him. I never would have believed it, but there he was. He rose again, and he was walking around. And, and Peter's saying, yet we have something more reliable than our experience. It's the written objective word of God. So as Christians, this is why we need to know the Bible, because this is the foundation for our knowledge. I often challenge, at college, students get really excited about reaching the world. And um, I'll often say to them, so you're going to meet people that challenge the scriptures. Have, have, you, have you read the Bible yourself? I see a lot of people get excited about apologetics and want to defend the very book that they've never read. Or defend the book that they've only read little portions of. Well, I really like the Psalms, you know, Sermon on the Mount, Book of Revelation. You know, I, like, I don't really read the other parts. How can you defend it if you've not read it? That's why we need to be students of the scriptures. And the more you, I'll tell you, the more you know the scriptures, the more you're going to see through fallacious arguments against um, the truth of Christianity. So the Bible is so key. Notice number two, because God is the ultimate author of scripture, uh, all his power and authority are invested in it. That is, when I use the Bible in sharing the gospel with people, I'm using it knowing that God's power comes with this. Now, what I don't want to do is do apologetics where someone asks a question, I simply quote a verse. Uh, that's why in 1 Peter it says, always give a reason, give the logic for why you believe it. Now, I will use the Bible, I will quote the Bible. You say, well, what about people that don't believe the Bible? That's okay, they're going to bring in their arguments, I'm going to bring in mine. It doesn't matter if they believe the Bible. When I quote verses, when I bring in what the scriptures say, I know that I'm bringing in the power of God. So I present my reasons and I fill it in with the scriptures. And as Hebrews 4.12 tells us, next point, letter A, the words of scripture have incredible power to expose, convict, and transform the human heart. Incredible power to expose, convict, and transform. Hebrews 4, 12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That, that which is invisible to you, the Bible can see and expose, and now notice verse 13, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So I want to use the Bible in my talks with people. Again, the, another approach to apologetics called evidentialism says the unbeliever doesn't accept the scripture, so we're going to put that aside and argue purely on philosophical grounds. I think that's a huge mistake because you can never prove anything philosophically. But with the scriptures, I have the authority and the power of God that can cut right through a hard heart and get right to the heart of the issue. And as they hear my explanations and they hear the word of God, they can be brought to conviction of their sin and their need for Christ. And then letter B, Christians follow the living God who has spoken. Who has spoken, especially with agnostics. Atheist means you don't believe God exists. Agnostic means you don't know if he exists. And if you're a strong agnostic, you don't believe anyone can know, whether you know or not. The best thing to do with an agnostic is, as well, who really knows? Say, well, um, what, what if there was a God and he revealed himself? Then we would know, right? Yeah, but that can't happen. Really, why not? Why can't it happen? 
Because as a Christian, what I'm claiming is that the Bible is the revelation of God, and it centers on God's momentous revelation in the person of Jesus 2,000 years ago. So you're saying we can't know, but you're discounting the very revelation of the God who has shown himself. In other words, it's a logical fallacy called begging the question. You're assuming what you're supposed to prove. You're assuming that if there is a God, then he can't reveal himself. That's begging the question. You haven't proven that God can't reveal himself, and can I tell you that I believe he has? And we have to look at the historical Jesus. And by the way, when it comes to history, oh, skeptics hate this. History is all on the side of the Bible. There's a guy at the University of North Carolina named Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman was a a student at Moody Bible Institute. Uh, Went on to Wheaton College and studied Greek and did his master's degree in the New Testament. Then went on to Princeton Theological Seminary, which is the uh, graveyard of a lot of Christian conviction. Uh, And he lost his faith at Princeton. He's a world-renowned New Testament scholar at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He teaches an elective class called Introduction to the New Testament. There's a waiting list hundreds deep. In other words, students come to the University of North Carolina to study whatever, and they all want in on this guy's class. He's written the standard textbook, and it's, it's a critical textbook. In other words, he tears down Christian belief. He's written at least 12 or 15 books against Christianity. The Lost Message of Jesus, the Orthodox Corruption of Scripture, misquoting Jesus. It's all about how what Christians believe is all wrong. And he's very effective, very good communicator. But a few years ago, some atheists tried to, tried to they had him on a radio show, and they, they tried to say, well, you know, who even knows if Jesus existed? And Bart Ehrman's a historian. He's like, actually, stop right there for a second. What do you mean by that? He goes like, the host was saying, well, we don't even know if Jesus existed. It could be a myth. And he said, wait, he said, I'm a historian. I judge everything by the historical evidence. I don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. I don't believe he rose again. But there's no question that he lived. And the host said, well, yeah, I know some people believe that. And, and Ehrman got angry. He said, no, stop. I'm telling you, you don't judge history on what you want to be true. I'm a professional historian. I'm a member of the historical guild around the world. I personally know over 2,000 historians. He said, I don't know one that denies that Jesus existed. And he was so riled up about that that he wrote an entire book defending the existence of Jesus. It's called, Did Jesus Exist? And he does, of course, he doesn't believe in Jesus as a savior or that he was a son of God or that he did miracles. But he, sa- he writes in the introduction to the book, there is no doubt that Jesus was a Palestinian man in the first century who gathered a group of followers around him, began preaching about the kingdom of heaven, got arrested by the Romans and crucified, and three days later, the tomb was empty. He said, there's not a single historian in the world, secular or Christian, that doubt that. (laughs) And the more you look into that, people like, as I mentioned, the Cambridge philosopher, professors that I mentioned, historically the Bible is unimpeachable. Every detail of the New Testament has either been proven or if they haven't found evidence for it, one of the general rules in archaeology is lack of evidence is not evidence of lack. In other words, just because we haven't found it yet doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And we're finding new things all the time. In 2009, up until 2009, critics said for more than 150 years, um, the whole story of Jesus being born in Nazareth is a myth. There, is, there was no ancient city of Nazareth. Nazareth didn't come about till many hundreds of years later. And in 2009, they were excavating the modern city of Nazareth to put in new water drainage system. And guess what they found? The ancient city of Nazareth. And this happens all the time, over and over and over again. Maybe you've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered in the 1940s. You know, they, a professor at Liberty University just found a new one last year. So that we don't, as Christians, we don't have to act like, oh, I'm just, it's a blind leap in the dark in my Christian faith. I just believe it to be true. No, everything in the, the New Testament, especially the Old Testament, of course, um, was preserved by the Jews. There's less question about things in the Old Testament. The bigger question is, did the New Testament things happen? There are just so much overwhelming evidence there that as Christians, we don't need to feel like we're backpedaling at all in this area. Let's move on then. Number three, Christians don't believe the Bible because they want to live with as many rules as possible. 
Rather, letter A, Christians believe the Bible because it lays out the path to a restored relationship to God. Some people actually think that we believe the Bible because we like rules. I don't know about you, I don't particularly like rules, but I've come to learn that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, as uh, Psalm 19 tells us, that God's law is a good thing, it's a delight. But I don't believe the Bible simply because it has rules. Rather, the Bible teaches us how we can participate in God's great work of redemption. That is, God, the Bible's all about God's doing this work of saving people in the world. And the New Testament primarily is about how can I join in, how can I have a part with that? And that's part of apologetics and evangelism. God is saving people, and he uses secondary means of you and me. But if we fail to do our part, as Jesus said the week he was coming into Jerusalem, when the religious authorities said, tell these people to stop calling you the king of Israel. And, and Jesus said, if, if these people stop, the stones will cry out. <laughs> if, if you fail to witness to someone, you have an opportunity. Jesus can use a billboard. Jesus can use a gospel tract that's been sitting dusty in a library book for 20 years. He doesn't need you. Rather, think about this. He invites us to be a part of it. He says, I'm going to bring these unbelievers into your life. And you have opportunity for incredible joy if you join in and be a part of speaking the truth of the gospel to them. Again, you know what that does to me? It takes all the pressure off me. It's not about me being this professional apologist and knowing all these things and impressing them. Rather, God brings this person into my life. I don't know if it's going to be for two minutes or 25 years. And I'm going to play my part in speaking the truth of the gospel. And if they come to Christ, I get to rejoice that I had a part in that. I got, to, I got to participate with God in his great work. And when you see evangelism that way, oh man, count me in. Because God is doing this great, incredible work of saving. So the Bible then is a single book, a library of over, of, not over, of 66 books bound by a single unified theme of redemption. The whole message from start to finish is God making a way for us to come back to him. From the beginning in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sin, and God is giving, doling out the curses on the earth, on the snake, on Adam, on Eve, but he says to the serpent, someday this woman's descendant will crush your head, and you will bruise his heel. So from the very beginning, God promises redemption. And all through the Old Testament, the sacrificial system, the temple, the tabernacle, was all pointing forward to the fact that someday an innocent lamb would have to be slaughtered to take care of our sin. And then there's 400 years of silence between the Old and New Testament. God doesn't speak a word to prophets. And one day, little old priest, Zachariah, is in the temple and an angel appears to him and God starts speaking again. And then a few months later comes to Mary and then Jesus is born and he lives his life and he preaches the kingdom of heaven. He preaches the gospel, repent and believe. And he dies on the cross and rises again and provides the way for us to be saved. Man, that makes me want to stop right now and start reading my Bible again because this is exciting stuff. If you like grand narratives, grand stories, epic series, whether you read or watch movies, some of you might be Star Wars people or Star Trek people. I'm a Lord of the Rings person. And those epic novels, which are so much better than the movies, the movies aren't terrible, uh, you know, speak of this grand story of of uh, evil and threat and danger and then redemption and salvation, the real story is we're living it every day. Every day that young mom of toddlers that's changing diapers, they're playing a part in the story of redemption. Every day that you get up and you wearily go to that job that you really can't stand, you're actually playing a part in this great drama of redemption. Uh, Every sermon that your pastor prepares and labors over, he's part of the great drama of redemption. Washing the dishes, you know, mowing the lawn, it's all part of it. Uh, and someday when God brings it to an end, we will look back and rejoice to see that God used every aspect of our lives as part of that great story. So further, the Bible, what is it? It was written over the course of 1,400 years from Moses till the apostle John by more than 40 authors. And a lot of times people who criticize the Bible don't realize this thing was written over 1,400 years and yet has this unified theme 
It was written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Aramaic is written just like Hebrew, but pronounced differently. It's kind of like the difference between the way you and I speak English and someone in central Georgia would speak English. Hi, y'all. How's it going? It's gotten so cold, my, my pops have frozen. I'm like, your pops have frozen? What, what does that mean? Pipes have frozen. So Aramaic is differently pronounced Hebrew, and then Greek in the New Testament. And yet all this difference, and it's written on three different continents. Paul's writing from Europe when he's writing in Rome. Um, uh, the Middle East is a crossway between Asia and Africa. All this, all this vast time, vast distance, separation of languages, all is united still in this one great theme. So one of our goals in apologetics then is to get unbelievers to read the Bible for themselves. I often encourage people in conversations, have you, have you ever read the Gospels? Have you ever read the accounts of Jesus? Because a lot of times they'll say, oh yeah, I think Jesus was a good person, you know, like Gandhi and other wise people. Yeah, C.S. Lewis said, no, th that's the one he cannot be. He cannot be just a good person, good teacher. Because when you actually read what Jesus said, he said, I'm God and you will never get to heaven apart from me. He's either a liar or he's crazy or he is who he says he is, the liar, lunatic, Lord. And lately people are saying, well, it could have been a legend. But again, when you study the way legends arise in the ancient world, they take hundreds of years there's no way that could have happened because they believed Jesus then and no one ever disputed the facts of the case. So what is the Bible? What role does the Bible play in Christian doctrine? There's an acrostic here, scan, that comes from the Reformation era. We'll just move through this quickly. The sufficiency of Scripture means that it contains everything we need to know for salvation and living in a way that pleases God. So the Bible is sufficient I don't need to read the Bible and the Book of Mormon or the Bible and something from Deepak Chopra or the Bible and, you know, the world according to Snoopy or something like that. The Bible is sufficient. Secondly, the clarity of Scripture means that the teaching of Scripture about salvation and godly living can be understood by all who seek to study it in belief. Now, of course, you can be a skeptic, read the Bible, and totally misunderstand it, totally read it wrong, and then say, ah, it meant, did nothing for me. But anyone who studies it in belief can understand what it's saying when it comes to the central concepts of salvation and godly living. Are there difficult things in the Bible? Yeah, really hard things, and that's the challenge of it. And yet when it comes to, how's a person saved? What must I do to be saved? <laughs> Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Um, how do you want me to live? Here's the Beatitudes. Here's the commandments. How am, I, how am I forgiven from sin? Repent, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins. Thirdly, the authority of Bible means that the Bible is revelation from God himself and that we are obligated to listen to it and obey it. So the Bible has authority. As Christians, every opinion we have needs to be submitted to Scripture. Well, in my experience, or among us Irish, no, no it, none of that matters when it comes to claims for truth. The Bible declares who we are. Well, in our marriage, we do it this way, it works. Well, I'm sorry, you should submit your concept of marriage to what the Bible says. Well, in parenting, you know, it, no, parenting, the Bible talks about that too. Well, when it comes to my money, no, the Bible talks about that too. In other words, I realize this is the authority of my life, and if I live by it, I get to experience the blessings of God. And then finally, the necessity of Scripture. It means that apart from God revealing himself to us, we could not know God. That is, God is wholly separate from us. If God did not reveal himself to us, I would not know. So we need the Scriptures. And we're told in Hebrews that in past times, God revealed himself in many ways, through dreams, through visions, through revelations to prophets but in these last days he's revealed us revealed to us through his son and the word of god we recognize as christians a twofold aspect of the word of god there's the written objective word of god but then there was the living word of god jesus and there's no distance between the two 
God has revealed himself. We can look at the life of Jesus and look at his words and realize scriptures are the authority that matches up to that. Let's move on then and talk about the triunity of God. As Christians, we believe God is one in three, three in one. Most Asian religions, such as Hinduism, Buddhism, the ancient Greek, Roman, Babylonian religions teach polytheism, which is the existence of many gods. If you've seen in Hinduism, for example, Hinduism is kind of a designer religion. You look at the gods, there's 330 million deities in Hinduism, which means no one knows who they all are. It's kind of a figure thrown out there that it's almost infinite. But for example, if you want business success, then you have a, a little shrine in your house to Ganesh, who's the, who's the elephant god with the many trunks in Hinduism, because Ganesh can give you business success. If you want revenge on someone, then you might set up a shrine to Shiva, who's the destroyer goddess, and uh, she'll take care of your enemies for you. And I was explaining this uh, just about a year ago up in, uh, in Worcester, Mass., to one of my former church members who's now a pastor, and I, there were 25 Indian Christians there. I'm thinking, oh man, I better get this right. Here I'm talking about Hinduism from purely a secondhand knowledge, and they came up afterward, and they were like, that's exactly right. People pick and choose the gods and goddesses, and, and that's how you get through life. Notice Judaism, Islam, and Mormonism teach that God is one without distinctions. There's no no sun, no, no spirit that's separate. There's just God. And Muslims, for example, um, are disgusted by the thought that God has a son because that would mean that God had to have sex. And some Muslims believe that we think the Trinity is God the Father, Jesus the Son, and Mary the Mother. They think that's what we believe, which is why if you're talking to a Muslim, you've got to clarify, no, no, the Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God doesn't have to have sex with a human being in order to have a son. The God of the Bible is both one and three. Mark, that's a contradiction. No, it's a paradox. It's not a contradiction. A paradox is a seeming contradiction, but when you explore, you come to realize God is both one but has distinctions within the Godhead. So God is equally three and one, He is not more three, I'm sorry, not more one than three, and not more three than one. You're like, this is really hard to understand. Yes, there's only three paradoxes in Scripture, how God can be both one and three at the same time, how Jesus can be fully God and fully man at the same time, and how God can be sovereign over all things, and yet we are responsible for our choices. And anyone who tries to solve those completely falls into heresy one way or the other. So those are theological tensions we have to maintain. God is one, but there is three persons in the Trinity. Jesus is fully God, fully man at the same time, and always ever will be, by the way. A lot of Christians think that when Jesus ascended to heaven, he kind of shed that human skin. No, Jesus today is still fully human in a glorified body, but he's forever the God-man, forever between standing between us and God as the bridge and the way. So we speak of one essence of God and three persons. And three persons in one essence. Now we could have a whole conference on the Trinity. We're not going to do that. But we have to make sure we have a proper understanding of this central truth if we're defending the faith. Well, how do we know that this is true? Because notice number six, all three persons of the Trinity are called God in the Scriptures, yet they're distinguished from one another. The Father is called God, the Son is called God, the Spirit are all God, and yet those three persons are distinct. And this is a whole different topic, but this is a precious thing to us because our God has um, not just one God that rules over all things, but he is a God who relates. And, And think about this. When I was in high school, I used to think, what was God doing before he created the world? I kind of pictured God like flying through outer darkness. I'm like, "Eh, no, because there was nothing else beside God. So there's no darkness, there's no outer space. So what was God, was he like in time sleep or something? Because I wasn't understanding the Trinity. What God was doing before he created the world was for all eternity, Father, Son, and Spirit, the three persons of the divine Godhead, were in perfect fellowship with one another 
loving, giving, communicating with one another, needing, God needing nothing outside himself. I often compare this to freshmen that come to Lancaster Bible College and immediately fall in love the first week. Uh, and they sit across the dinner table and the world is tuned out and they're just focused on each other. Uh, you know, needing nothing outside themselves where food gets cold. Now that's a very awful, crass illustration of God. But God, Father, Son, and Spirit, perfect fellowship for all eternity, needing nothing outside themselves, out, God outside of himself. And then God chooses to create when he knows the creation will fall, knows it will require the death of the Son of God, and yet God still does it. He doesn't need us, but God's very nature is to give and to love and to pour out. That's a God I want to know and to serve. A few more things here than the scriptures teach that each of the persons of the Trinity is God, yet there is only one God. God is one God. The Trinity, then, is not a contradiction. There, there is no logical contradiction in that, but rather it is a paradox, an apparent contradiction. And we, know, we know what apparent contradictions are, things like jumbo shrimp, um, you know, government confidentiality, things like that. You know. We live with paradoxes, things that don't make sense, but they're not a contradiction, and that's true of the Trinity also. And then lastly, let's go to the attributes of God, which are really essential for apologetics. First of all, God is a personal God. The God that Christians trust and defend is a personal God. That is, he possesses rationality and self-consciousness. God speaks, he saves, he delivers. And secondly, in addition, the Christian God is absolute that means he's over all things. Again, in many other religions, different gods have their areas. In the ancient, in the ancient uh, Canaanite world in the Old Testament, there was Baal. We hear a lot about Baal in the scripture. He was the god of fertility. He was portrayed as a, as a steer or an ox because if you owned an animal like that, you were considered wealthy because you could breed that and that would provide meat and food and they could pull the plow. And um, Baal controlled fertility. Remember on Mount Carmel when Elijah goes up there? Uh, what was the sign of fertility in a dry, arid agricultural area? Rain. And so you'd go up on Mount Carmel where lightning strikes on average eight or nine times a day, and you would have an altar to Baal there, and you would pray to, God, to Baal for, um, for fertility. And that whole scene with Elijah's fasting, Elijah goes to their home court where lightning strikes constantly, and challenges them, okay, let's hear from Baal, and all day long, no lightning. And then Elijah says, I'm going to build the altar to the Lord, and it's fire <laughs> comes down, consumes everything. And it's very clear, Yahweh, Jehovah, is the one true God. Well, the Bible teaches that God is not territorial, not over parts of the world. God is absolute. He's over all things. Notice the impersonal gods of philosophy Islam, Allah, is impersonal. There's no forgiveness in Islam. There's no redemption. There's no relationship with Allah, which is why if you're trying to reach a Muslim, have them to your house and listen to them pray. Let them listen to you pray over your meal. God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving us this food. I'm so thankful that you've given us Jesus. Heavenly Father, bless us. We love you. That blows their mind. They don't talk like that. When you get to paradise, you don't get to be with Allah. You get to be with your reward, the, the 70 brown-eyed virgins. There's no relationship with Yahweh. I'm sorry, with, with Allah. And as a Christian, for you to pray and talk about God and how God loves you. By the way, Muslims are coming to Christ all over the world, and this is one of the things. they are Because they're made in the image of God, they are hungering for relationship. And it's found in Christ. So these impersonal gods are absolute, they're over all things, but not much different than the law of gravity. In other words, it's something I submit to, but I have no relationship with it. You know, I submit to the law of gravity. I don't step off for story buildings because I submit to the law, but I have no relationship with gravity. And sadly, in a lot of these religions, that's the way God is treated. And no relationship with it, it just I have to observe it. Alternately, many religions have personal gods who are not absolute. 
So again, in Hinduism, you have 330 million deities, each with their own name. But each one is only over some little area. Notice all false gods are either personal or absolute, but not both. Only the Christian God is both personal, has a name, speaks to us, delivers us, saves us, comforts us, and he is Lord over all things. There's not a square inch of this earth over which Christ does not cry out, mine. This is all God's, and yet he's a God who gives himself. And then finally, or number four, God is sovereign, which means that God works out everything in conformity. I didn't give you enough space here. Everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. When we're talking with unbelievers, we can say, listen, God's in control of all things. I don't know why God is allowing this in your life, but I know this, that this is not happening without a reason. And God's trying to help you to see that you need to come to him. What a comfort that is for us as Christians, isn't it? Nothing that comes into my life is an accident. Uh, it's been, oh man, how many years now? 13 years ago, I was a young seminary professor, had just left my church and um, tootling along in life, in good health. And one day I went to get a cholesterol check and the doctor came back and said, well, you got high cholesterol, but you got a much bigger problem. And he said, we, we did a blood test and you have one kidney working at 23% function. I'm like, no, come on. Look, look at me, doc, I'm a specimen. Like I said, this was a long time ago. He's like, no, you're gonna need a kidney transplant within the year. And instantly my world changed. And we didn't know much about kidney disease at the time. My wife uh, went through a deep time of grief and mourning, expecting that I would die. And they were able to hold me off for five years with medication, but uh, we're coming up on the eighth anniversary. I had a kidney transplant. And the, the most comforting thing through that is this is not a surprise to God. And you know this if you've suffered, if you've gotten a diagnosis of a disease. The one thing that comforts you is God is in control. This is not a surprise to him, even though it totally changes my whole life. And uh, for several, the last year or two before I had my transplant, I got really sick. I was teaching full-time, working on my doctorate, coaching all my kids in sports. And uh, I would teach at the seminary in the morning, and then it was all I could do to climb the steps one floor up to my office. And I'd have to take a two-hour nap just to get through the day. I was so sick. I was really close to needing dialysis. And then God provided my brother-in-law. We always wondered why my sister married him. Now we know why. We're going to harvest all his organs from him. <laughs> my brother-in-law gave me his kidney, and uh, the, day I, the day of the transplant, I felt better than I'd felt in years. And it was amazing. And what comforts you through all that uncertainty? It's the fact that God's sovereign. And as Christians, we rest in that fact. Now, that raises certain questions that we'll get to tomorrow morning. If God's in control, why doesn't he do something about the evil and suffering in the world? It's the number one objection to the Christian faith. And we'll talk about that tomorrow morning. And then lastly, number five, Christians believe the aseity of God, which means that God is completely self-sufficient, independent of us, and needs nothing outside himself. That is, God does not need us. God wasn't sitting up in heaven saying, oh, it's so lonely up here. Oh, man, I've got to create someone that, that, to make me less lonely. No, God does not need us. Paul talks about that in Acts 17. God doesn't dwell in houses built by human hands as though he needs anything from us, for he himself gives us all things. God does not need us. God did not need to create. And yet he did, knowing the end result, knowing it would cost him the death of the Son of God, that's how much he loves you. It reminds me of friends from my church that adopted three Russian orphans who had been so messed up by the uh, neglectful, abusive system there. And for more than 10 years, their family suffered incredible turmoil trying to help these children come back to normalcy. I look at that and think, that's a picture of the gospel right there. They didn't need that. They were doing fine. They had three kids of their own but they were such loving people, their hearts overflowing with care that they said, we've got to help these children and it cost them dearly. And yet they did it for the sake of love. That's what God does for us. And that's the message that we're giving to people is God doesn't need us. God didn't have to save us, but he loves us even though we're enemies of him, even though we hate him and rebel, he reaches out and he draws us to himself. 
So those are the truths we hold dear. And if we have those things rooted firmly as we're sharing the gospel, we will not go astray and forget the, the truth of the Christianity we're trying to defend. <sighs> I'm fighting against the clock here. Questions. We have a few minutes for questions. We'll take a five-minute break and then come back to the last session. <laughs> 